Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. Survival is the rule of the day. My jaw was broken. I could feel my molars in the centre of the We're out there to take country. We're out there. At the end of the day, everyone is their job. wearing green is a soldier. Getting yourself blown up does some interesting things to you. Uh, a place like the Middle East is constantly There's changing. The what we do there is constantly changing. We killed, though. And this, the thing was our own mind food. He held me up with a broken whiskey bottle and machete. Welcome to today's bonus episode of Life on the Line. Tomorrow is Remembrance Day, and to talk about this very special day of reflection and commemoration, I have a very special guest. The Honourable Dr Brendan Nelson has a long and distinguished career in public service. Just to name a few, Dr Nelson was the Federal President of the Australian Medical Association before serving as the Federal Member for Bradfield from 1996 to 2009. He was the Minister for Education, Science and Training before becoming Minister for Defence. After a key ambassadorial role, which we'll come back to, Dr Nelson was appointed as Director of the Australian War Memorial in 2012. This is our conversation on Dr Nelson's love of history and the importance of Remembrance Day. Enjoy. I'm in Dr Nelson's office at the Australian War Memorial. Thank you for having me and for coming on the podcast, Brendan. It's my great pleasure. Brendan, when did your interest in history begin? What drew you to it? I don't know if there is a particular moment. Uh, My father was adopted, so I don't know what his family history is in a military sense. But on my mother's side, my family goes right back to the Gallipoli Landing. My great-grandfather was a member of the 12th Battalion. His enlistment number was 26. Uh, He was a mechanic from Mowbray in the 12th Battalion, of course, a Tasmanian, and they were at the landing. He survived until October, severe enteric fever, shipped out, ended up in Alexandria, went into the Ambulance Corps for a year, and then because he was a mechanic, he was put into one squadron in the Australian Flying Corps. And then one of his sons, my grandfather, and his five brothers all served in the Second World War. So I grew up in a family environment where you were constantly seeing these uh, black and white photographs on mantelpieces, uh, hanging on walls, and attending Anzac Day in my youth. Uh, Then when I was practising medicine in Hobart, I ran to after-hours medical services. I literally went into several thousand homes and I noticed in those days that anyone over the age of 75 had similar photographs to that of my grandparents. And in some cases, rooms that were empty that had never been touched since 1916. I always remember it. I remember working in the emergency department of the Royal Herbert Hospital and seeing uh, veterans come in, and if they had one last breath left in their body as they came out of the back of an ambulance, they'd say, I'm repat, you know. I didn't really understand what that meant until later. Uh, and then when I became Minister for Defence, that really piqued my interest in it, uh, not only what we were currently doing, but of course the history that informed those events. When you were appointed Minister for Defence in 2006, what was it like to be suddenly thrust into the military world? You had your own military ADC and had to adapt to a role that I imagine is quite different from most political positions. Well, I'd had a taste for it in year 2001. I had been appointed the Parliamentary Secretary for Defence, and that's like the junior, junior minister. And uh, Peter Reith was the senior minister, and I was given a range of responsibilities, including responsibility for the defence estate, the acquisition, management and sale of properties, the defence cadets, defence IT, emergency management, and a range of things like that. So that gave me a taste of it. But it was rather daunting, I must say, when it was late January 2006, I'd been Minister for Education, Science and Training for over four years, and John Howard called me. I was on my last day of two weeks' leave. I was mowing the lawns, actually, and uh, emptying the catcher, and John Howard rang and asked me if I'd go to defence. And uh, I've got to say, if he'd said to me at that time during that call... uh, Brendan, can you have a look at the F-35 and tell me if you think it's the best aircraft that we should be getting and so on? I would have said to him, I beg your pardon, I've got no idea what you're talking about. Two days later, I was being driven out of Yarralumna, having been sworn in, and it was was daunting. Uh, It was uh, highly complex. We had 
10 operations, four of them were big. Uh, we were acquiring a lot of defence material uh, regularly at the National Security Committee meetings, I'd have six or seven submissions, uh, sometimes billions of dollars of uh, decisions to be made. We were obviously trying to further take uh, reform in the Defence Department and the Defence Portfolio. Uh, so it, it was it was very, very hard. Um, in fact, to, to this day, it remains the hardest job I've had, but Im- immensely rewarding. In fact, you mention... Uh, ADC. I, as I said, I'd been driven out of Yarralumla and I'm back in my office. There was chaos because my staff had moved my office from where I'd ministerial office in education. I'd moved into the office that I was going to use as defence minister, so those, those Bedlam. And one of my staff came in and said, there's a young woman from the Air Force here that says she has to see you. And I said, what the, what the heck does she have to see me about? And, and he said, look, I, I don't know, but she's insisting she has to see you. So I said, OK. So this young woman walked in, uh, then flight lieutenant, her name was Sharon Cooper, and she said, Minister, I'm here because I'm your ADC. And I said, my what? She said, your ADC, your aide de camp. And I said, what the heck is that? And she said, well, I'm here to serve you and to be a conduit effectively uh, in a in a formal and semi-formal way between you and defence. And I said, oh, OK. And she described what her... Uh, tasks would be, and I thought, well, this is a, an added bonus, and and that w- it was it, it it was a bit of an adjustment. I'm not a person who's big on protocol and formality and that sort of thing, but you you start to you, you realise that's a part of the culture in defence, uh, which might, in a ceremonial sense, seem a little bit uh, odd. But then I realised with the passage of time, it's also a, a significant part of the. Uh, military chain of command and the culture within defence, which I respect, of course. After speaking to Sharon, I know that at the time she was learning on the job as well, but putting the brave face on for the minister, deer in headlights, so you were both there together, I think, in the thick of it. Yes, yes, we, we went through quite a bit, that's for sure. I'm sure there are many highlights from your time as Minister for Defence, but from your visits to the Middle East, is there a particular memory that stands out for you? Well, look, above everything else, I've always been proud to be an Australian, uh, but nothing has ever made me prouder than to see these young men and women doing what they do in our uniform, under our flag, in our name, in these remote parts of the world. Uh, I always remember this young female uh, army engineer. She's walking across this... uh, obviously a very sandy environment in Afghanistan where we were in the process of constructing Camp Holland. And uh, I said to my chief of staff, I said, gee, I wish Australians could see this. Here's this woman quite authoritatively, I think she was a captain, and uh, she's making notes as she's walking along, she's directing orders to people to do various things. Absolutely inspiring. Uh, Similarly, at uh, Talil in central southern Iraq, I arrived there, I think it was my first visit, and uh, no, no, it wasn't, it was in 2007, it was in my second year, and there were a group of our soldiers um, on their ASLAVs had just returned from a two-day patrol, and I remember these young soldiers, like 20, 21, 22, grimy faces and so on, and uh, they're exhausted, and one of them looked up at me as his... uh, uh, put his weapon to one side. They, they were in the process of pulling their stuff apart, cleaning it and the like. And he looked up at me and he said, Sir, I, I think the Iraqis appreciate what we're doing for them here. He said, uh, it, it really makes a difference, you know. I might also add, uh, I was on HMAS Parramatta in the Gulf, and the ship is constantly at at least 24 knots. And these guys are doing running boarding parties, they're avoiding all sorts of threats that are in the water, surveilling, uh, intercepting, facing danger, the very literal danger, uh, 24 hours a day, every second of the day. Very, very impressive. And so what I realised is, that, and I came to learn, is that these, there's something... People would say to me, oh, we've been lucky in the sense of the number of casualties we'd had. And I'd say, yeah, well... Luck's a part of it, but it's more than luck. It's four things. The leadership in the Australian Defence Force at every level, from the generals and admirals and air marshals down to corporals and sergeants, at every level is outstanding. 
Secondly, the depth and breadth of training that's provided to these people. Thirdly, the equipment, the material with which they're provided, but there's something else. There's something about the Australian character. These young soldiers who see themselves as not just uh, soldiers, but aid workers, diplomats and teachers. And they don't just simply arrive in another country and say, well, here we are, uh, we know better than you do. They essentially see their job as to being to understand rather than to judge. A, a highly, highly impressive. During your role as Australian ambassador to Belgium, Luxembourg, the EU and NATO, you built strong relationships with the Flanders communities where so many Australians lost their lives in World War I. It must be very satisfying to see in recent years the recognition and honour now given to Australian sacrifices in the Somme from the Franco-Australian Museum in Villa Bretonne and the impressive memorials and Anzac Day services. Well, well, it is. Uh, I've got to say, when I was uh, Minister for Defence, uh, John Howard asked me if I'd go to Gallipoli for Anzac Day in 2007. Uh, the way things used to work, the Prime Minister in the government I was in anyway, he made the decision as to who would go where for these big commemorative events. And needless to say, there was a lot of lobbying for these things, but uh, I didn't lobby for any of it, and then I was asked if I would go there. So I, I went through Iraq and Afghanistan, the Gulf states and so on, and then I arrived at Gallipoli, and uh, and I've got to say to you, privately, I used to despair. I used to wonder why it is that people were so interested in Gallipoli, but far fewer knew anything about what we did in France, let alone what we did in Flanders. So I remember on the afternoon of the 24th, standing down there at what's now Anzac Cove, and I had two of my close protection guys, SAS guys, who'd come on from the Middle East trip just as private citizens to appreciate the Anzac experience at Gallipoli. And uh, we were standing on the beach looking up at the ravines and gullies and the steep rock face above us. And I said, it's unbelievable, you know, to think that that's what they did. Uh, This was an amphibious landing and that six months earlier they'd only been, uh, you know, shearers and shopkeepers and here they are in the dark having to do that. And one of them just said to me, they will see, you know what we do. But if someone told me that we had to get into boats and land in pre-dawn darkness with the enemy entrenched up above there, you'd have to consider it a suicide operation. So I got Gallipoli after that. But I think what's now happened... Uh, in fact, I had four people who came to see me again in 2007 who wanted to establish an Anzac Day service at Villa Bretonne. And I was surprised to know there had never been one. And what had happened was that the then Department of Veterans Affairs apparently had opposed this idea there'd be an Anzac Day service at Villa Bretonne. And they'd been to see my then junior minister, Bruce Bilson, who was quite supportive of it. And uh, he was the Minister for Veterans Affairs. And uh, I said to them, I said, well, of course this needs to happen. So anyway, we put things in train. And and then to his immense credit, Alan Griffin, who became the Veterans Affairs Minister the following year, 2008, after we lost office and Mr Rudd became Prime Minister, he really took this on. So now we're in a situation where I think you can reasonably say almost as many Australians have some sense of what happened in France as they do at Gallipoli and the the importance of it and indeed the scale of the losses in at least in 1916 and 1917. Unfortunately, however, there's still only a, a small minority of Australians that have any sense that Flanders is in Belgium, that, that what actually happened in the Ypres salient, uh, particularly 100 years ago this year in 1917. We've got uh, almost 14,000 Australians buried in Flanders, 6,200 have no known grave, And the three big battles of the First World War were, of course, the Verdun, the Somme and Passchendaele, the Third Battle of Ypres. So I think we've gone through the centenary of the commemorations of the Third Battle of Ypres, uh, the commencement of the Tynecott Cemetery in late July, uh, the Australian ceremony at uh, Polygon Wood, the Butt Cemetery in September. So I think that it's played a, a significant role in bringing more people there. The other thing which we did at the Australian War Memorial is to send the Meningate Lions back uh, and have them placed on plinths immediately in front of the Meningate uh, Memorial on the medieval wall around Ypres. And that's also played a role, in my view, in drawing Australian attention to the significance of Flanders in Belgium to, to us and not only our history but who we are. 
Well, at the time, it was remarked that you were quite a frequent visitor to Eben, the Menin Gate in particular. What drew you there? Well, unless you've been there, it's hard to explain, but I say to people, put it on your bucket list. At the end of the... For those listening, perhaps you don't know, at the end of the First World War, the British were struggling with how to recognise those who'd been killed in Flanders... In this, we're talking Flanders in Belgium, who'd been killed but bodies were never found. So they settled on the design of this magnificent stone arch, which is on the medieval wall around the town of Ypres, which has a population of just over 30,000. And during the First World War, almost every soldier who fought and died on the Ypres salient marched across the Menin Gate. It's called the Menin Gate because in medieval days there was a gate there across the moat and the road would go to the town of Menin. So in 1856 the gate was, uh, the, the drawbridge was taken away, the Menin Gate lines were placed on the bridge and it was opened up. So they built this magnificent stone arch uh, edifice and uh, it has three large circular openings in its roof and the names of 55,000 missing are inscribed on the inside and all around the outside, including 6,167 Australians. And every night from 1928, it was opened in 1927, but every night from 1928, the local fire brigade members have been played the last post at 8pm, except during the period of the German occupation and the Second World War. So I went there not long after I had arrived in Brussels. I wanted to go down and meet the key people in Flanders who'd be involved in Anzac Day, Remembrance Day and other commemorations. I went to the Menin Gate. I had already been to the Menin Gate when I was Minister for Defence. And uh, in fact, on my uh, last night in Belgium before returning to Australia, my wife and I went to the Menin Gate again. And the chairman of the Last Post Association who conducts the ceremony, a man called Benoit Motry, leaned over and he said, Ambassador, this is your 74th visit. I said, Benoit, have you been counting them? And he said, we didn't at first, but we noticed you have come more than any other official that we have ever seen. And I said, mate, if it was in Brussels, instead of a 90-minute drive, I would have come every night. One of the fortunate things about my current role is that I'm able to go to Belgium uh, about once a year. In fact, I have to as a part of my job. So I've been back to the Menin Gate uh, probably seven or eight times since I came back to Australia. For those of listening, perhaps who are churchgoers in some form or another, it, it is a bit like going to church. You feel much better for the experience. And every night's the same, but every night's different. I had one occasion there where there were 10 Highland pipe bands who played Highland Cathedral. Uh, I've seen uh, platoons of German soldiers there. I've seen all sorts of things, uh, but it, it's very meaningful. And I have on many occasions actually recited the ode uh, under the Menin Gate. It's a very special place. And I just say to people, look, if you can possibly get there, then please go. Having been there myself nine years ago, I couldn't agree with you more. It's very special, especially one of those evening services. You were appointed the director of the Australian War Memorial in 2012 and described it at the time as a dream job. What is it about your role here that you love so much? Well... Firstly, yes, I was appointed, but I actually had to apply for the job and go through interviews and all sorts of things. Oh, right. Um, yes, I know. Some people just think, oh, the government must have rung me up and said, hey, mate, do you want to run the Australian War Memorial? I made that assumption, I, yes. I can, I can definitely assure you that wasn't the case. And uh, so, no, I went through a process. I came back to Australia for an interview, and then I uh, was told uh, some weeks later that I had been uh, approved, uh, been recommended by the selection committee, and I'd been approved by the then Gillard government, for which I'm extremely grateful. I think uh, in life generally, you can make whatever you like of whatever job you have. And uh, I've always taken the view you've only got one life before you know it, it's gone. And you've got to put every single thing that you can into whatever you're doing. And I say also to young people, the best way to get the job you want is to concentrate on the one that you've got. In terms of this job here, yes, you've got to manage staff and you've got to manage budgets and, and those things, and they're obviously very important. But it's a unique place and it's a unique job, and I, I'd like to think that I've expanded the role to some extent uh, beyond that the great work done by my predecessors. Firstly, it's a shrine, the Australian War Memorial. Commemoration is a significant and an increasingly important part of what we do 
and what we offer to our nation and international visitors. Secondly, it's a museum. And so we, our mission, our charter, is to remain true to the vision articulated by the founder, Charles Bean, in 1948. Here is their spirit in the heart of the land they loved, and here we guard the record which they themselves made. But our task is to make this history live, to make it engaging to and engaged by a new generation of Australians, whether Australian by birth or Australian by choice. We live in a world that Charles Bean could not have imagined, and whilst remaining true to his vision, we've got to do everything we can to see that this is a place that people want to come to or visit in the virtual world, and in doing so to get a, a deeper understanding of what it means to be an Australian. This is where we reveal our character. It's also an archive. Uh, I find myself also heavily involved in the art world. We have one of the most significant art collections in Australia, 38,000 works by some of the nation's greatest artists, from George Lambert to Ben Quilty and everything in between. We're in the education world. We're in the tourism space. We're on the margins of, of politics. But, of course, there's no party politics here. There's no religion. There's no race. There's, we don't see rank. This is one of the unifying institutions in a country that unfortunately seems each day to be increasingly divided. There's one place that unites us and it's this. Every day here is very different. Um, there's emotion here every day in one form or another and uh, one of the things that I did uh, very early on, in fact in my first week, is to propose that we introduce a last post ceremony here at the end of the day and, and actually do more than is done at the Menin Gate. I used to look it up all those names and as the, the bugle would be playing uh, the last post or the buglers would be playing it, I used to look up and wonder why don't they tell us about at least one of these people. So that's something we do here. So it's a, it's a wonderful job and I say to, to, I'd like to think that when I do finish uh, that there will be many more people who will be interested in being the director of the Australian War Memorial than might have been so the case five years ago. And anyone who has a Facebook page should check out the Australian War Memorial Facebook page. They live stream that last post ceremony every day and it's always special. I'm sure there are many, but what has been a highlight moment in particular for you during your time here as director? Wow. That's I know. like, uh, <laughs> well, I don't know if you've got children yet, but uh, when you've got children, it's like asking you to name your favourite uh, child. Look, I, I've had some remarkable experiences here. Laying on your stomach, cleaning the tomb of the unknown Australian soldier in the early morning light, looking down Anzac Parade to the Parliament, just on your own, cleaning it. The performance of I Was Only 19 by John Schumann, who wrote the song, and Hugh MacDonald, who's now passed on, who's been with John since his very early days. They performed uh, Only 19 to 108 Vietnam veterans and nurses in the Hall of Memory in front of the Tomb of the Unknown Australian Soldier, the song of their war of their generation. I think the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Long Tan, the last post ceremony, to have 400 Vietnam veterans there in the commemorative area and uh, to tell the story of Kenny Gant from Mount Gravatt who was killed at Long Tan, 21-year-old conscript and to hear him, the recording of him singing Danny Boy for his mother. The dedication of the Flanders Memorial Garden. We brought soil back from Polygon Wood, the Menin Gate, Hill 60, Tyne Cot, Toronto Avenue in Messine, and uh, to put it into this uh, beautiful, beautifully designed circular Portland stone structure. We had the ceremony at 7.30 in the morning. Very, very special. Might seem like an odd thing to say in terms of my highlights, but I think introducing the last letters and diaries of men and women from the memorial to Lee Kernigan and Garth Porter, and then seeing them take those stories and turn them into music, the spirit of the Anzacs, and that being the biggest selling album in Australia in 2015, taking this story to a new audience. The last post ceremony that we did for Luke Gavin, who was killed in Afghanistan, standing there with his widow Jackie and her three children on one side, the president of Hungary and his wife on the other. And as Luke Gavin's story is being read and his life and how he was killed, hearing the president of Hungary's wife sobbing next to me, and then at the end of it, uh, Luke Gavin's young daughter, only six or seven, wrapping her arms around her legs and looking up and saying it's OK to cry. I cry about a lot too. Th these are just some of them. The, the, the day, 13th of August 2013, when we opened the Afghanistan exhibition, 
having been told when I first arrived it'd be years away and it wasn't possible to get it done and we had no money and so on. Wouldn't have happened, by the way, without the financial support of Boeing. But to get that get that up uh, and running. So giving, but having the privilege, I must say, uh, uh, to deliver the Dawn Service Address at the memorial here in uh, 2016 in front of 55,000 people, that's, that's a real highlight. But anyway, they're just some of them. Tomorrow is what is known throughout the Commonwealth as Remembrance Day and in the US Veterans Day, formerly called Armistice Day. Millions of Australians and others around the world will observe a minute's silence. What's the significance of this tradition? Well, of course, it comes from the day that the armistice was uh, declared uh, to end the First World War, at least to end the conflict, at 11am on the 11th of November 1918. I think one of the things in life is to be imbued with the imaginative capacity to see the world through the eyes of others. Our, Our comfortable lives breed easy indifference to... Uh, the individual sacrifices made in our name and the way life was, in this case, a century ago or almost a century ago. But you've got to imagine we we were a population just about that of Melbourne today. We had a million men of an age that could volunteer from a nation that twice said no to conscription in national referenda or plebiscites. We were deeply divided. We came out of the First World War victorious, but inconsolably mourning 62,000 dead. We had another 60,000 who died within 10 years of returning. That's the way we were. We were a deeply divided society in the 1920s. And so Remembrance Day, Armistice Day, the day that the guns stopped, had immense meaning to every Australian in every part of the country. And as the years have gone by, uh, a bit like Anzac Day itself, it, it's gone through a period where people falsely conflated respect for this particular day and the minute silence as being, in some bizarre ways, being supportive of war or conflict, which of course no sane person is. But I think now what it means to us and to, to stop, and I say to people, look, just set the alarm on your clock or your phone or something, it just to stop for a minute and reflect on the fact, as we sing very regularly, Australians all let us rejoice, for we are young and free. We are young. Our nation became, we became a nation in 1901, of course, millennia of rich Indigenous history, but we became a nation in 1901. We got a flag in 1903, and we are free. And we are free in no small way because of all of these men and women, two million of them, who wear and have worn the uniform of our three services. Yes, in hindsight, you can look at the madness, as some people would see it, of some of the wars in which we've been involved. But generally, particularly in the Second World War, our vital interests were at stake. And there's no doubt for the First World War, if the Germans had completely controlled continental Europe, we'd be living in a different world today. So I think it, it has extreme importance and meaning to all of us as Australians, whether we wish to recognise that or not. I, and, and by the way, I, I wouldn't make uh, judgments about people who choose not to, to have a minute's silence or, or so, so on. And we're a free country, people have a right to be wrong. Uh, but I, I do think it is important. And the world's changing. It's, it, it's always changing. But I'd also say sometimes in history, you can go through a period of transformation in humankind and live through that period and not realise the scale of what's happening. I think we're living through such a period now and I think the most important thing for us is to be absolutely clear about who we are, who we are as Australians in what we believe and to remind ourselves that there are some truths by which we live as Australians and they're worth fighting to defend politically, diplomatically and sadly at times militarily. And, and this is what defines us. What defines us much more than our constitution, the machinery of democracy we've inherited from the British, is our values and our beliefs, the way we relate to one another and see our place as the world. And this is a part of our DNA. This is a part of who we are. That's why it's important. Anzac Day is a very significant date in the Australian calendar, almost becoming more so each year. What makes Remembrance Day different and significant in its own right? Well, of course, you know, we all know the story of Anzac Day and the origins of Anzac Day and 
I think Remembrance Day is different in the sense that it's the day that marked the end of conflict. Anzac Day in some ways has come to represent a part of our emerging birthrights, a significant touchstone in terms of our emergent national character uh, back uh, over a century ago. Whereas Remembrance Day is much more, and its origins of course are about the end of conflict, of remembering, you know, literally remembering those lives that have given service, that have made sacrifices, lives that have been given completely for us, our freedoms and in the hope of a better world. And Remembrance Day, in my view, is just that. It's a kind of a collective gathering and a minute's silence to renew our commitment to one another and the ideals of mankind. So it should never be the reason for someone not uh, wishing to pay their respects on Anzac Day. But if for some reason people feel hesitant about marking Anzac Day in any physical uh, way by attending services and so on, then Remembrance Day has a slightly different uh, feel and certainly a different origin. They're both very important days. I don't regard one as being any more or less important than the other. By the way, in, in Europe, having lived in Europe for three years, Armistice Day, Remembrance Day is the day. That's the day. And see, this is the other thing too. We would, we had very deep wounds inflicted upon us and scars out of the First World War. But we have never been invaded. The Indigenous Australians, of course, have a different perspective on that, perfectly understandably. But as a nation, we have not been invaded. We, we were very concerned about it, particularly in 1942 in imperialist Japan. But in Europe, until you live there, it's hard to get it. It's hard to believe now, but the last 70 years has been the longest period in human history that there's been peace in continental Europe. These people have lived with changing borders, invaders, all sorts of conflict. Families that have found themselves living in three different countries over 150 years as borders keep changing. We've not had that experience. So for them, Armistice Day, Remembrance Day, the end of the conflict particularly the First World War, is extraordinarily important to them, as, of course, is the end of the Second World War. We were talking earlier about how the landing at Gallipoli has such a seminal place in Australia, and we've been catching up almost to our knowledge of France and the recognition of things that happened in France and Belgium and so on in the First World War, because Anzac Day has that direct link to Gallipoli. But Remembrance Day is the end of the war on the mainland. Do you think that could be part of the cultural disparity in our country? Yeah, I think that's a good point. I, I think that is a part of it. Anzac Day's origins are in a particular event. And as a nation, yes, we'd had the naval and military campaign in New Guinea in late 1914. But here was the Australian Imperial Force. Uh, they had gone to Egypt and there were nearly 2,000 Australians sent home in disgrace uh, who'd uh, had venereal diseases, they'd been misbehaviour, all, all sorts of things. So the nation was a bit nervous about how, the, how were we going to go. And then the first report back from Gallipoli, from the landings, was not from Charles Bean, who would have been more conservative in, and was in his description of things, but it was from Ellis Ashmead Bartlett, the highly acclaimed and experienced a British war correspondent, and he sent the glowing report back of how, about how the Australians had gone. So there was an immense relief and lifting of the national spirit out of what had happened at Gallipoli, and it was our first. You had this, as I said earlier, the, the amphibious landing and these young men that were poorly trained uh, with the Turks at that stage, at least the first 24 hours, a lightly defended part of the peninsula, but nonetheless they had the advantage of height and so on. Whereas Remembrance Day came an armistice had came at a point when we were exhausted. John Monash had taken control of the Australian Corps, thank goodness, and we'd had a series of stunning victories through 1918 from Hamel through to Monsanguin. But we came out of it, as I said, victorious and proud of what we had achieved, but we were deeply, deeply wounded. And uh, 62,000 dead. The armistice was an immense relief and everyone was deeply deeply touched by the First World War, um, even if you're you know, opposing it. In fact, you think politics today in Australia is uh, deeply divided. It was far, far more divided in that period. How will the Australian War Memorial observe Remembrance Day this year? 
Well, for 2017, uh, we will do what we normally do. We will conduct a commemorative service here at the Australian War Memorial, a commemorative address that will be given by the Australian whom we have invited uh, to do so. There will be the singing of hymns, there will be the laying of wreaths by key dignitaries and the diplomatic corps. Uh, we will have our VVIPs uh, will place floral arrangements on the tomb of the unknown Australian soldier. It, it will be broadcast uh, live of course uh, through the ABC it's like Her Majesty the Queen you know she's she went through a period where it was almost fashionable in certain quarters to be critical of the Queen and the royal family and she has remained steadfast in the magnificent way that she has uh, discharged her responsibilities as the monarch of Britain similarly our services here people have said to me oh we should introduce this we should change that get rid of the hymns and I, I say to them well no, the crowds are increasing. People are finding increasing meaning in and relevance from the way the service is being conducted. And we're not running a commemorative service here on Remembrance Day to make some sort of fashion statement or respond to what we think are changing trends across the country. I think, uh, coming back to something I said earlier, I think it's increasingly important that we be steadfast uh, within reason in making sure that this place is a place of continuity, of stability, and gives Australians a sense of meaning what it means to be an Australian. So, as I say, we remain true to Charles Bean's vision. We, we do a few things to make it um, more engaging to people, but, but we're not changing the service radically. In 2018, we will obviously run the service again, but we've got a lot of activities that we are planning from early October through to and including Remembrance Day itself in 2018. And finally, Brendan, why should every Australian make the trip, the pilgrimage to the Australian War Memorial in our nation's capital? Well, firstly, it's, it's not possible for everybody to do so. I realise that. Some people live in very, very modest circumstances. Uh, they don't have the financial means. They live a long way from the War Memorial. But if it is possible to do so, it isn't possible to fully understand us as Australians, what makes us tick, our character, until you come here. Uh, you stand in the commemorative area around the Pool of Reflection, you look back down Anzac Parade across the lake to the Parliament, to our political capital. But you look up at those names in bronze of the theatres where Australians have fought and died more than a hundred years and ask yourself, why were we there? Then you step up into the Hall of Memory in front of that tomb of the unknown Australian soldier. Sentinels, 15 of them, stained glass windows, images of Australians from the First World War and a nurse and underneath 15 words, virtues, values, and you look at the inscription on the front of the tomb, from the eulogy to the unknown Australian soldier, he is all of them, and he's one of us. He is all of those 62,000 killed in the First World War, he's all of the 41,000 that have died since, and he's one of us. We reveal ourselves as a people here. And uh, I said to Tony Abbott, uh, when he was Prime Minister, proposing we have an Arlington-style cemetery in Canberra. I said, look, Tony, we love the Americans. We are free people in no small way for 300,000 American casualties in the Pacific from 1942, 103,000 of them dead, half their bodies never found. But we're Australians. We've got one man buried at the War Memorial. We have no idea who he is. He's certainly not a general, an admiral or an air marshal. He's probably a private, a sapper, a corporal, a sergeant, a junior officer. He could be an Aboriginal Australian. We don't know. But we're Australian. We revere the idealism and the heroism of the everyday Australian. And then on the roll of honour, 102,700 names. Everyone is equal in death. Some posthumous Victoria crosses, others intoxicated and fell off a ship. Everyone is equal in death. And, uh, and then as you walk through the galleries and you just you look at the Afghanistan exhibition and you hear uh, Nick Perryman saying, uh, you know, the Andrew Jones dying, don't leave me, Jonesy you realise this place, the paradox of this place, is that it's not actually about war. It's called the Australian War Memorial, but it's not actually about war. It's about love and friendship. Love for friends, love between friends, love of family, love of our country, and honouring men and women whose lives are devoted not to themselves, but to us and their last moments to one another. And that the legacy of this place is that a life of value, irrespective of the cost to yourself, is one spent in the service of others. That's what it's about. So, so if you can come, uh, you will not be disappointed. 
Thank you, Brendan, for your ongoing service to our country at the Australian War Memorial and for speaking with me today. My pleasure, Alex. You can find out more about Dr Nelson and the Australian War Memorial at www.awm.gov.au. They also have a great social media presence on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. They're at the username AW Memorial on all three or just search for Australian War Memorial and look for the blue tick. And if you can, do plan a trip to Canberra. The power of visiting this shrine, archive and museum cannot be overstated. During the interview, Dr Nelson referenced his ADC, Flight Lieutenant Sharon Cooper. She's now Wing Commander, retired, Sharon Bowne, and we spoke with Sharon in the first week of this podcast. So go back, look for our second episode, and hear Sharon's side of the story of working with Dr Nelson. The producers of this podcast, Thistle Productions, have had the privilege of collaborating with Dr Nelson before. Dr Nelson was interviewed for the documentary miniseries for School and Country, which he launched in 2015. You can find out more about that documentary at www.theschoolandcountry.com. If you like this episode of the podcast, please make sure you're subscribed to get all content. We have an interview with an Australian war veteran out every Tuesday and bonus episodes like this out most Fridays. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast and on Twitter at LOTL Pod. Our email address is podcast at lifeonthelinepodcast.com and our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. And if you know a veteran serviceman or servicewoman with a story to tell, please get in touch. We would love to have them on the podcast. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design. Music by Dan Van Workhoven. Thank you for listening. We will be with you for that minute of silence tomorrow on Remembrance Day. Lest we forget. Lest we forget.